awesome. So um, I usually don't do the conference hand raising thing, but I'm going to today. So uh, let's see, um, number of hands for people who consider yourself just a developer. All right, what about just an ops person? Who considers yourself a DevOps practitioner? <clears throat> okay, good, good, I'm getting a lot more hands. Um, how many people consider yourself an Agilist? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, that's a different talk. <laughs> All right, well, um, at least for the wide number of hands that went up for uh, when I asked about DevOps practitioner, you guys are going to appreciate one thing that I want to do right off the bat, and that <clears throat> is be transparent. All right, I'm going to give you a quick timeline. So uh, February 1st, 2018, the Great Comp CFP ends. Uh, that means that on January 31st, 2018, I was up drinking. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I submitted a proposal for the, key, uh, the keynote at this conference? Well, uh, February 11th comes by, and I'm invited to speak here, but not for the keynote, for all the things I'm doing tomorrow. May 10th, Soren writes me and says, oh, by the way, there's a keynote session. Yeah, that was a shocker. <laughs> so um, I want to be honest and put some disclaimers out here. This thing went together fast. You may see some typos. You, it might be boring. It might be a little painful. Uh, there might be some disjointed slides. I'm not going to have a witty presentation long analogy or theme like we had with magic this morning. Now, I will tell you that I will do a magic trick for you today on this stage. I'm serious. <clears throat> I'm not going to be pulling kroner out of citrus fruit. I'm going to be pulling a keynote out of chaos. So um, the way we're going to do this is I want to support the community because really when we talk about DevOps, it's really about the community. It's, it's practitioners supporting practitioners. So as I go through this, I want you to, uh, to know that you can feel free to stop me at any time, and we, we'll go in. I usually don't do like a really deep conversational Q&A types of things, but this has to be uh, presented to, to my community, which right now is, is all of you. And uh, I want you to know we're going to make it through together. So all those things about uh, this potentially being boring and painful, I'm going to be there suffering with you. Maybe a little bit more because I'm in front of you. Now, I do have my flask on me, so I might not let it hurt me quite as much. Um, that's a disclaimer. So what do you say we move into to the, actual, um, the actual presentation? <coughs> this is a story of Lee Fox. I used to look like that. I'm the one in the middle. And uh, back when I looked like that, you know, nice and happy before I became an architect, I uh, uh, work for a company called Team Tech, and this was a really cool company. I uh, um, did trade show support, so I went to shows like Comdex, Internet World, Java One, IBM Technical Interchange, Lotusphere, just to name a few. And what my job was there was all IT operations. In the course of one week, I would build a network, I would service it, and then I would tear it down and ship it out and then move on to the next conference. And that was pretty cool. Got to do a lot of traveling. It was awesome. <coughs> um, however, somewhere along the way, uh, Team Tech decided that they wanted to build their own software, their own flagship product. So they decided, we've got some trade show experience. Let's build uh, information kiosks that we can, we can deploy. Uh, this is not what they look like. I worked at this company 20 some odd years ago and they are gone. You try to find product pictures from that long ago. Um, and I, I loved it, you know. It was, it was the best of both worlds that, that young Lee was able to, to partake in. It was high energy from all the conferences I got to go to. I, I had stress and excitement from the IT side, but yet I still had this opportunity to sit down and code and, and write stuff and, and be passionate about it. I loved it. But like I said, it was young Lee. 
At some point in time, young Lee decided, I need to pick uh, a career path. I need to, uh, to have a specialization and, and grow up. So I became a developer. And I loved it. Went through a lot of uh, different organizations, did, uh, did my time in the dot-com world, and uh, wrote some rather interesting code, all the way up until the point where I got to uh, the level of software architect. <coughs> and right around that time, this thing called the cloud started to emerge. It's like, whoa, now that's some serious cool technology. And as I began to look at it, I started to hear people talking about this thing called DevOps and how if you've got a cloud shop, and if you've got a traditional IT shop, this, this DevOps thing was going to make your life great. This DevOps thing could take that, that really angry architect and make him happy again. And I was like, oh, I gotta do this. So I, I dove into it. I did a, a career switch from development over to the cloud. I use, I, I use DevOps as my, my vehicle on how to get there. And what did I find? I found that I'm doing basically IT operations and I'm coding again. At the same time, my career came full circle. That's where I am today. That's what brings me with, to you uh, to, to give this uh, talk. And um, as, as I go through and, and think about um, DevOps, uh, and, and I want to give you the state of it. I want to tell you where we are right now. I want to tell you where we are likely to go in, in the next couple of years. Like we really need to understand the history of it. So let's talk about the past. We did the story of Lee. Now let's do the story of DevOps. <coughs> This is uh, just a brief timeline of uh, the history of DevOps. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on here, mainly because I grabbed it really quickly and I noticed after I put it on the slide deck that uh, about two, or you, two years are missing. So we'll start off uh, in 2007. 2007, there is uh, this gentleman. His name is Patrick Dubois, and he's from Belgium. Patrick was a consultant, and he was determined to learn every aspect of IT operations. He was frustrated by this, this clash between development and, and operations that he saw on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, one day, he would be a developer, and he's living through all the, the cadence and discipline and, and the, the repeatability of being a, a developer through agile processes. And he's like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. You know, I, I like it. But then the next day, um, he might choose a contract that allowed him to go more into the operations side. And now what is he dealing with? He's dealing with interrupt work that's coming in, production outages. He can't plan his day. It, it was crazy. And not only that, he was, in, in looking at all of this, he's trying to figure out how can, how can any sane organization have these, these groups work together? You've got development who on one side is motivated and usually incentivized by the number of features they write, the number of changes they introduce to a system. Then you've got operations who's there and uh, they're incentivized and, and motivated by stability. What's the best way to get stability? You get it working and you take your hands off of it. That's right, you back off and not only that, you, you step back from it with your hands off, and you defend it from other people putting their hands on it. <clears throat> so how does this work? He, he started some blog articles and uh, was trying to get some, um, some feedback, and it didn't happen until 2008 at the Agile 2008 conference. There, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Clay Schaefer, he, he was there and he started a birds of a feather session at this conference and he called it agile infrastructure. So Patrick was like, oh yes, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And uh, he went to this birds of a feather session and sadly only one person showed up. It was Patrick. Andrew, who scheduled the session, did not show up to his very own birds of a feather. And that left, uh, that left him uh, just 
you know, defeated and a little bit upset, but he knew that this idea had some merit. Let's talk about it. So Patrick one day found Andrew, and they began to exchange messages back and forth, email messages, messages over the Twitter sphere. And uh, they, they started to rough out some, some ideas. Move forward to the, um, the uh, 2009 at the O'Reilly Velocity Conference. Patrick wasn't able to go, but he, he'd already put out some of his ideas about this, this new thing. And agile infrastructure was about the best thing that, that anybody could call it at the time. So um, while he was not there, um, gentlemen, John Allspaugh and Paul Hammond delivered the infamous 10 deploys a day talk. Um, these guys were, were gentlemen who worked at Flickr, and they were talking about uh, how their organization started to automate a lot of deployment, right up from the, the point of check-in. And um, it took the, the world by storm. Patrick was... was Amazed, he started talking more and more to, to some of these gentlemen, to, to a lot more of the attendees of Velo that Velocity Conference, and uh, people began to, to joke around. Hey, what if we were to go and have one of these conferences in Belgium? You know, you started this, this whole t uh, gig. Let's go in and find out more about it, have some deeper discussions. So Patrick is like, oh, all right, I'll, I'll have a con uh, conference here. Well, he knew that it was going to deal with development. And he knew that there was an operation side of things. And he knew that this conference was going to be two days long. So he came up with the conference name. And interestingly enough, it stuck. And it went crazy. It, went, it took the world by storm. I mean, the talks that they had there sent people home motivated, and uh, practitioners were, were amazed. Look, we, we might have a solution to, to some of our problems on a day-to-day -day basis. We might be able to change somebody else's work life for the better. So we get Ghent in 2009, that's Patrick's conference, the following year, Sao Paulo, Hamburg, Mountain View, uh, Sydney, they all started this, and it only took off from there. I mean, everybody from London over to, uh, to Brazil, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Cairo, they all wanted this stuff, and they all needed to talk about it because it was great, and they were doing it all in a community format. Everybody who had an idea was able to, to bring it to the table. And, and have it taken seriously and actioned on. It was beautiful. And it started a whole bunch of new thinking. I mean, look at this company, Etsy. You know, they, brought, uh, they saw a lot of new benefits out of this. Uh, they, they looked at it from a perspective of ramp-up time. So imagine, back in 2009, 2010, to have this, this concept where a developer uh, starts on their first day and they don't leave the office until they push code. How many of us can do that in our organizations today? Start somebody today and have them push code by the end of the day. I, I see a couple iffy hands up there. Maybe we could. It, what do you mean by push code? Um, there's a lot of other thinking, too. There, you had uh, Bizarre Voice. So uh, Bizarre Voice th started thinking about new service models. You build it, you service it. No longer will ops need to, to be the ones who are uh, strictly sitting there on the pagers uh, 24 by 7. And not, will, not only will they not have to, to go and, and uh, take care of a production issue at 3 in the morning, we're going to ask the developers to do that. But why? Well. The developers are closer to the product. The, the developers are able to debug this a lot faster than, than the operations guys. They, they know all the, the inner workings of it. They're looking at it uh, in terms of, of white box versus black box. They, they can get to stuff faster, so why not? And if, the, if development and operations are truly working together, then there shouldn't be this, this 
droll concept of only ops are the people who have to suffer through, through pager calls and, and late nights. The entire team can do it. These are some of the thoughts that, that started to, to gel. <coughs> 2010, uh, we have, um, as I mentioned, a, a bunch of DevOps Days conferences, including uh, this one, Mountain View, uh, California. And uh, it had two gentlemen, Damon Edwards and John Willis. They came up with this brand new concept. They wanted to, to take this, this DevOps thing that was coming and try to define it more. So they called it CAMS, standing for culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. And said that if you were going to do DevOps, if you were going to have a DevOps shop, then you needed four pillars to be addressed. Uh, first, you start with you start with culture, and uh, you've got to remember that it's about the people and it's about the team. So uh, that's what people were trying to do. They were trying to get past this this conflict of development and operations, focusing upon the, the team, but not at the expense of the individual. You had to, to build culture to make this happen. There was automation, which is the heart and soul of DevOps, because they found that with a lot of the tasks that were being done, uh, all, right from the, the start of uh, development to the, the pushing, the executing, and the maintenance of code in the production environment. The, these were repetitive tasks that really were not very tolerant to human error. Uh, so we needed a way to, to accelerate that and make that better, inter-automation. There's measurement. They realized that if we were trying to, to create this, this organization, create this, this thing to, to improve our lives, how are we going to do that? We have to have a measurement. Because without a measurement, we won't know if we're better today than we were yesterday. We've got no comparison. We've got no way to, uh, to help provide standards and goals for where we want to be. DevOps needed this. But more importantly, we needed to share. I mean, it's about community, right? And community should have a, a full sharing a full access to, to the body of knowledge that, that is being built up. <coughs> 2011. 2011, DevOps got a great shot in the arm. This gentleman, Cameron, Heit, Cameron Haight from uh, Gartner, wrote, uh, wrote a, a presentation, and in there he slipped in this little tidbit. By 2015, DevOps will evolve from a niche strategy employed by large cloud providers into a mainstream strategy employed by 20% of global organizations. How many people speak analyst? Basically what that means is he's saying DevOps is the next big thing. It's going to happen and it's going to be important. Uh, the fact that it came from, uh, from a Gartner study and a Gartner paper that made it a little, a little bit more uh, acceptable and gave it a lot more boost, more credibility. So we now go to 2013, and I give you The Phoenix Project by Gene Kim. Who's read The Phoenix Project? All right. Now, uh, put your arms down. Everybody else, put your arms up when I ask who's going to read The Phoenix Project. It doesn't matter if, um, if you're in the DevOps environment or, or if you're just a developer, you're a QA engineer. If you are anywhere within our industry, this book is amazing. It, it's a story about a failed company, or, or a doomed project, I should say, um, that could potentially fail a company, and, and how people were, were struggling with it and all the problems that, that came up out of it. Um, buying in large, this book is held as, as the DevOps Bible. This is, this is uh, the first thing that any serious DevOps practitioner will answer when, um, when asked, okay, so what should I go out reading right now? And I'm going to make this promise to you right now. Any one of you who reads this book, if you do not like it, if you do not find that it is impactful, you can find me, and I'm going to buy you a drink. 
I promise you right here, right now on the stage. So furthermore, in uh, 2013, GitHub went and creates this concept called chat ops. They're looking at, um, at one of the, the emerging concepts within uh, DevOps called self-servicing and trying to find ways to allow people to do work themselves rather than, than having to go and wait on, on a given ops engineer or a given developer to get something done and creating bottlenecks. We want to try to do as much of that as we can um, by ourselves. 2015 comes along, and uh, do you remember CAMS? That got changed into columns. Uh, the L was added by Jez Humble, who uh, he wrote the continuous delivery book. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, he wanted to, to say uh, there, there needs to be something else in here. Uh, we don't want to get ourselves into to a position where we're letting uh, resources and um, time and, and anything else run rampant. We, we don't want to, to get ourselves into a point where there's too much process. So L stands for lean, built and based upon the, uh, the lean methodology from the Toyota standards. And, and again, like Agile, the lean is another talk in and of itself, which won't happen right here, right now. But um, now DevOps is Calms. And I don't know about you, but uh, since it became Calms, I'm actually feeling a lot calmer, even as an architect. I'm not that, that super angry architect all the time because a lot of these pillars, uh, actually all five of these pillars, have personally given me a lot of uh, flexibility to handle problems and, and make things better, to make my teammates happier. So why the history lesson? Well, it's to point out that DevOps is from practitioners for practitioners. It's to point out that because we've got so many people, there's not, uh, in, inputting into it, there's not one true embodiment. But it is absolutely community driven. It's driven by experiences. We didn't dream up DevOps as a community because we just thought it was going to be a cool idea. We dreamt up DevOps as a community because we were having some real problems as a community and we needed a solution. But I also want to point out to you that anyone can play. That's interesting. Um, anyone can play, so uh, that is odd. Um, remember the, the slides that weren't polished? because they came together too fast. All right, here we go. So today, with, with history behind us, we are going to be talking about the state of DevOps. And um, you know what I could do? To get us out of here easier and faster, I could just go and cite the, uh, the state of DevOps report that's produced every year by Puppet Labs, uh, where they talk about things like um, deployment uh, metrics and uh, how fast we're deploying at lead times, where they're talking about high performing and low performing teams. But I'm not gonna do that. That would be too easy. And we wouldn't get any real deep meaning. Plus, you can just go and download those reports, uh, the 2016-2017 reports from uh, the Puppet Lab site, and read them yourself. What I want to talk about is, what is DevOps? I mean, where are we? It's, it's, still, um, it's still in a state of flux. It's in a state of flux because it's done for practitioners by practitioners, which is a good thing. But it just means that we need to be vigilant about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So here's some of the, uh, the current issues that we have. Um, we don't know if, uh, if DevOps is still really set on being more about the technology and the tools. I mean, things like continuous delivery, containers, um, serverless technology. Or if, um, and you know, by this, uh, we, we do need to, to look at the fact that uh, some, of this, uh, some of this technology is important. Hallmark uh, of DevOps integration cannot have CI, CD 
Um, or, I'm sorry, you can't have DevOps without CI CD anymore especially since a lot of the code that um, code bases that we've had written in just the last several years have grown exponentially. It's harder. There are more dependencies. Um, more organizations want it. Um, metrics are aligning so that you absolutely have to have it. Look at those, um, those, those de state of DevOps reports from Puppet. Seriously, they are talking about performance, and that's really the only key metric that they're looking at. And how do you get yourselves to be higher performing and, and to have a success? You need to have this, this technology there. There's a lot of information out there about it. This is still our continuous delivery CICD uh, Bible. It was written uh, 10 years ago. I definitely suggest it as a good read, even for uh, the developers or QA engineers in the house. Doesn't matter what you're doing. This is something that you need because it's going to, to be a technology. It's going to be a process that's utilized by your, your community, by your culture. You've got containers uh, providing immutable infrastructure for applications, uh, a lot of flexibility in networking, uh, increased density to keep uh, more, more applications and functions on the same virtual machine, um, all working well with orchestration. So what that means is a lot of the automation that we need for that A in CAMS is going to be easy to realize. A lot of the flexibility that we want is going to be easy to realize. Um, in terms of, uh, of uh, operation environments and supporting them, then uh, the, the Im immutability factor is going to keep people from keeping their fingers right into the production system. They can have access to it and they can work with it, but we, we know that there, anybody who's going to be touching it is going to be touching it in a much safer fashion. You've got serverless technology that's inexpensive, highly scalable, uh, provides immutability. Again, um, a lot of the same concepts, just in a, in a slightly different way uh, and uh, with different platforms. But all of that stuff with technology and tools, we still don't know if we can really distinguish it from the people and the processes. I mean, that's really important. We, we cannot get to, to where we want to be in terms of a successful pro production environment and, and delivering value to a customer without these two things, right? Right? Cool. So let's talk about people and processes a little bit. I want to focus on a couple of things. Um, we're going to talk about lean product management, trunk-based development. Uh, we're going to look at uh, inclusion of teams. So uh, lean product development has a couple of tenants in it. Um, we've got to meet our overall needs for our customers. Uh, we want uh, data-driven experiments. Uh, we need to, uh, to look at uh, roadmaps in terms of not our solutions and, and feature sets, but our customers' problems. What problems do they have now? What problems are we going to tackle for them? What problems may they have in the future? And then uh, idea generation and collaboration over solutions and, um, and mandates. This is kind of like the... the the Agile uh, Manifesto, four points. You've got things on, on one side of the word over. Um, and it's not to say that we don't value everything that you see up on that, that slide. It just means there are certain things that we value a little bit more. And the reason why we, we value this is because we're, we're looking at getting to, to the value as quick as possible. We're looking at making sure that, that we don't have any waste to get in the way of, of keeping our, our customers full of value and, and keeping them delighted. So when we look at, at uh, in this particular case, our, our L um, and our, our Ms uh, in, in columns, we want to be sure that we've got ways to, uh, to get to a lean solution. We want to be able to have um, good ways to measure it. Trunk-based development is a, um, is a process. We all have different, uh, different branch uh, strategies for, for developing. Some people like to develop with feature branches. Some people like to develop with long-lived version branches or release branches. Um, some people like to do it just off of one single, single line. And I'm here today to, uh, to say that I've seen a lot of people moving towards trunk-based development, uh, keeping everybody within the same branch of code. 
It provides uh, freedom from merge hells. You don't have as many code freezes. Um, your, your code history is linear, and it's a lot easier to understand. If you've got 20 versions or 20 branches of your product out there, and you need to, at a snapshot, figure out the history of everything that's gone on in the, in the past, that's really difficult. Uh, you get fewer broken builds, easier pipelines. So it makes everything a little bit more efficient. And when we take this concept and apply it to, to columns, we're seeing that uh, we've got a good nod towards, towards our A, towards our automation. We've got a good nod towards the L for, uh, for making everything lean. And uh, since there is going to be just one branch, a single branch, that's really easy to measure. There's our M. We, we find new, uh, new, many numerous ways to attack all of, of the pillars of DevOps in the things that we're doing, and we're seeing more and more of that happen. Another thing I'm seeing happen lately is uh, more of an inclusion of groups. I mean, look, we've got DevOps, we've got development and operations. I'm seeing a lot of people talking about DevSecOps now. Let's include security. I was at a DevOps Days conference uh, two years ago, and I heard somebody pr uh, propose DevSecQuaOps. He's like, you know what? That's not enough. How about DevSecItQuaOps? Or DevSecPerfItQuaOps? I'm just going to go DevOps. The concept is to focus on that, that C, the, the culture. The culture is everybody in your organization. So what if, uh, if we don't call it DevSecPerf it qua ops? It's a lot easier to type, hashtag DevOps, so we're just gonna go with that. Focus upon that, that C, that, that inclusion, uh, the sharing. Make sure that you're sharing information, knowledge, and processes across everything. And thank God I've seen so many organizations starting to embrace that more and more uh, lately. So um, some specific examples. We've got DevOps. I've seen uh, SecOps. I've also seen QAOps. And I'm absolutely serious. Google it. You will get a hit on QA ops. It's out there. Um, you know, another thing that I'm seeing a lot of, chaos engineering. How many of you are familiar with Chaos Monkey? Have you ever run Chaos Monkey? <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> All right, Chaos Monkey is a tool that Netflix gave us. And what it does, is um, in, in the AWS farm that, uh, that Netflix runs, it just randomly goes out and picks a virtual machine and kills it, kicks it over. It's dead. Hey, they're, they're introducing failure into their system? Why would they do that? But it's, you know, it's not just that. They've got a whole army of monkeys. Okay, you've got Chaos Monkey that kicks over individual machines. There's Chaos Gorilla that takes down entire banks, entire zones of machines at one time. Um, there's a lot more uh, in terms of uh, Dr. Monkey, which is one of my more favorites. Uh, I kind of like uh, Conformity Monkey, uh, which makes sure that all the systems look the same or else they get terminated. Compliance monkey for security, uh, janitor monkey for, for uh, systems that, that uh, uh, have just been hanging around and orphaned for a while. Um, Netflix came up with this because uh, they wanted to in interject failure into their system. But they do it in a very controlled manner. It sounds chaotic to begin with, but Chaos Monkey is typically only run when people are actually there to handle the problems. You don't run Chaos Monkey at uh, three in the morning on, on Christmas Eve. It just doesn't happen. Nobody's in the office, nobody wants to work, so why are you gonna go and take down your systems? But Monday to Friday, eight to, eight to five, eight to four, I guess if you're an executive, two until three, um, these are valid times to run it because people are there. 
They can handle the, the issues that, that come up. And the more failure that you introduce into your system and the more failure you're able to control, the better your systems are going to be because you'll see the, the problem and you'll begin to, to uh, work on, on the solutions. So this is where we get this idea of chaos engineering. And chaos engineering says that we've got five pillars, so I'll go through all of them. Steady state behavior, we're going to vary real world experiences, we're going to run experiments in production, we're going to automate our experiences, and we're going to minimize blast radius. So what does all that mean? Well, uh, starting with steady state behavior, this is our M in, in columns, definitely. The idea is to focus upon the measurements. Uh, we're going to look at things that are external to the system, or more specifically, things that are, are uh, visible externally to the system. So uh, error messages, latencies, throughputs, uh, these are, are types of things that we could easily see in, in any running application. Um, we're going to form hypotheses about these metrics. And then uh, we're going to say that based upon a certain number of metrics, this is what my healthy system means. Um, and we can use that to verify that systems are actually doing the work that we want it to. We don't care about how they're doing the work. We want to know that they are working, that they're doing what we're supposed to. So real world experiences. Uh, Find out what the real world experiences are for your system. And that could be uh, all the touch points, the URLs, the, uh, the network considerations, uh, requests and traffic. Um, these are, are going to, generally speaking, be anything that can affect your steady state. So um, if, you, if you have your, your, your concept of steady state, you know what your healthy application looks like, and how to, to interact with your application. It gives you the ability to tweak things, change a, an input, see what the behavior is, measure it. You get to do experiments. Which, speaking of which, where do you run your experiments? In production. Yeah, I said it. And I meant it. You test in production. For chaos engineering, at least. Maybe, maybe not your, your functional development testing. Um, and why is this? Well, much uh, like Michael said in the, uh, the keynote this morning, the reason why we do this is to remove assumptions. We can set up a, a QA or UAT environment for, for applications, but it's not going to have the same load. It's not going to be on the same networks. It's not going to have the same VPN connections. People are, are not going to be using it the same way. And we, we make assumptions about the production system based upon how that's going to work. We want to take all that stuff out so that we know exactly what we've got. By running our, our experiments for chaos engineering in production, we get control. And I promise you, every effective DevOps engineer wants control over their systems. They also want to be able to step away from their systems. And they know that the only way that's going to happen is if they've got control. So um, the experiments, we know that they're running in production. They have to run continuously. Use automation to make that happen. Uh, the experiments are often going to be uh, fairly intensive to run. And um, what we want is we want uh, to, to have these things running so that we can validate the, the knowledge that we've got about how the systems work and, uh, how, and, and that things are, are working um, to, to our, our level of satisfaction. Now, this can be dangerous. We're not going to lie to you. If you are running tests against your production system, it could be dangerous. So what you want to do is you have to be responsible. Be aware of, of your dependencies. Um, isolate changes of, that could happen into one container or, or one, one component of your application and isolate them for, from everything else. I'm going to do a shameless plug right now and tell you that um, there is a talk tomorrow called DevOps Archaeology that really focuses on uh, how you can, you can do a lot of this. Uh, there are a lot of tools provided for, um, for getting things isolated down and running experiments again and again. So um, 
what are different ways that we can mitigate issues in, in our production environment to reduce the blast radius? Any suggestions? Anybody? Well, what we can do is make sure that everything is componentized a lot. Um, reduce things down and, and use immutability. Uh, have a, a bill of inventory of everything that you are deploying to your production environment so that you can, at a moment's notice, uh, run one of your, your chaos engineering experiments and, and validate via a hash, a hash sum about uh, um, what is running and are the proper versions of everything running. I have a lot of monitoring uh, set up so that um, you know if uh, your, your systems are emitting bad data. You can, um, you can use uh, health checks coded into the application to externalize a lot of the, the internal behavior so that they can become externally visible metrics that you can use and as a feedback loop through, uh, through the chaos engineering. All right. Uh, those are the big trends that, that I see within, um, within the present. And I think that I've got just enough time left uh, to, uh, to talk about the future of, of DevOps. So uh, there's only about three or four big trends that, that I really see coming down uh, the pipe at us. And uh, one of which is the roll up of uh, DevOps tools. So we currently have a ton of things out there that fall into this, this DevOps arena. Whether you're talking configuration management technology uh, like Chef or Puppet, Ansible, Capistrano, or uh, if you're looking at something that might be offered as, as part of a, a cloud platform like um, AWS's CloudFormation, uh, it might be... Um, it might be delivery pipeline software, things like Bamboo or Jenkins. All of that stuff is uh, usually put together in a, uh, a heterogeneous environment. Things have to work together with a lot of integrations. You still have to take th all that, your, your different choices for all these tool sets, uh, get them working together, and then integrate that into your own environment. So um, I see that uh, we've got great things with uh, containerization and orchestration happening. Um, a lot of applications are becoming very, very container friendly. The tools uh, for, for managing Docker containers uh, or containers in general, things with, uh, with Kubernetes, um, cloud uh, tools like uh, ECS or EKS, are going to provide easier uh, paths for integrating all of these, uh, these despondent tools. And over time, uh, probably in the next year or two, we're probably going to see the, uh, the first real emergence of uh, tools that will be your one-stop DevOps shop. Uh, people have tried that in the past, uh, usually under the, uh, the category of, uh, of pipelining software. But it wasn't very pluggable. It wasn't very easy to integrate into systems. I think that the containerization is going to make it a lot easier for us to, to stitch despondent systems together and uh, make that happen for us. So keep an eye out for that. Um, automation and testing. This is the year. This is the year that we get serious as an industry about testing and doing it uh, with full automation. I've said this before, this time I mean it. I mean it. We are going to see a lot more of it. And the reason for it is, um, for this prediction, is just that uh, there is a lot more exposure to, uh, to DevOps now. I mean, we've got uh, over 50 or 60 different DevOps conferences. Uh, practitioners, uh, the number of practitioners are increasing uh, daily. People are going to start pushing this a lot more. So um, I think that uh, the DevOps culture is going to, to bring this about. But we, we've also got a lot more emphasis on CI, CD pipelines. And the only way that we can ever have a successful CI, CD pipeline is if we uh, have the automation to go behind it. Because we want that flexibility. We want to know that when I check in code, uh, I, can, um, I can take that, that release candidate and pr move it to production as quickly as possible or strike it down as quickly as possible. Uh, we're going to see a lot more people shifting left. And um, what this means is uh, we've got this a lot of concepts of things that, that we want done in our production systems. So a good pr production system 
what have we done to it? We've secured it, right? We've done performance testing against it. We've done some, even more than performance testing, we've done functional testing. We've checked it for compliancy, for um, SOX, PCI, uh, GDPR, all that, that, that stuff. Th that makes a good production system. But all that stuff, that's the hard stuff. It is incredibly difficult to make sure that, uh, that our systems get performance tested the right way. Now, um, what about the left side of, of the development uh, cycle, where things start off with, with our coders. What are they doing? They're writing code. And they've been writing code for decades. They've got this down. Writing code is easy. So when we start to, to look at everything as code, whether it's infrastructure as code, compliancy as code, security as code, if we can move it left to the developers, and let the developers do what they do best. Things are going to be a lot easier in the organization. We're going to be able to see uh, branching strategies applied. We're going to be able to see better design applied to, to security and performance testing uh, compliancy. Um, this year, we will, I am sure that we'll, we'll start seeing a lot more articles coming out about shifting left. People have been talking about that for uh, two or three years at this point in DevOps conferences, and I think it's starting to gain a, a little bit of uh, momentum. We're gonna see um, a shift in uh, some of our metrics, or I just wanna point out some metrics to you, uh, performance metrics and uh, salary metrics being the, uh, the two big ones. Our deployments, again, are going to focus on uh, what we see with um, with deployment times, lead times uh, that we get within the uh, the, the DevOps uh, uh, the DevOps reports or the state of DevOps report from Puppet. Now, notice that there's a big difference between the 2016 and the 2017. Um, this is going to get faster. Even our low performing teams are going to get to to a point within the next couple of years of being able to turn out to, uh, deployments between once a day and once a week. Uh, the, the thing that is going to get in our way of making sure that as an industry we will get uh, to that point faster is process. We're going to need to, to worry about um, our software development processes, our releasing to production processes. We're going to need to uh, basically go back to those agile and, um, and very flexible development processes that, that we've learned through software development. And of course the big one, salaries, jobs. Right now, there are more people um, with DevOps engineer titles than there are software engineer titles. And this is globally. Comes from uh, Puppet Labs. They also do a salary report. Uh, now granted, um, I don't have, I don't have multiple years worth of data to, to put together a lot of strong conjecture. But based upon the reports that we've seen, the um, DevOps engineers and software engineer roles are at about parity. They're making, uh, they're making about the same amount of money. Uh, DevOps salaries um, do look like they're going up. The number of DevOps jobs looks like it's going up. So there's, there's going to be more of, of a pool of money within uh, the, the DevOps arena. Uh, where we see some changes are manager salaries are, um, are decreasing. Uh, we also see we also see uh, systems administrator salaries uh, decreasing as well. Um, salaries uh, will change based upon how large the uh, the fleet of virtual machines and infrastructure is. So uh, typically, the larger fleet you have, the the more the DevOps engineers are are going to make. I'm hoping that uh, software engineers, uh, as a title will be able to, uh, to pull upon that trend and leverage it too. But basically, um, the, the number of servers that uh, an organization has affects the salaries that they're willing to pay all the way up until about 2,000 servers, and then they, they kind of level off a bit. So um, whether, uh, whether you want to, uh, to look at, um, 
a DevOps engineer career as a possible change or to encourage somebody else to go into it. Uh, this is one of the, the more powerful uh, metrics that I can, um, that I want to talk about today and make sure that you guys are aware that DevOps is rising and uh, at least through, through salaries and some of the other uh, softer metrics, it's, it's here to stay. So um, with that, according to my, cal or my timer, I think I'm out of time, um, and I really wanted to make this uh, about, um, about the community and uh, the practitioners. So now we can go into to, uh, a discussion time. Uh, we, can, we can talk about um, any questions you might have and uh, explore this thought a little bit more. Um, I'll open up the floor. Yes, sir. I think it's going to happen uh, because uh, um, we, we are seeing a, a larger growth of, of DevOps engineers. And, and keep in mind, this is just, it's just a title at this point, uh, at least the way that I want to, to um, approach it. And the way that, that I see it happening is uh, software engineers, as, as DevOps grows, they're going to start just naturally doing a lot more operations type of stuff. Things are going to shift left. They may get retitled uh, into to being a DevOps engineer. They may get more money because of the, the extra things that they're doing. But I think that those are going to be some of the, uh, the trends that we'll see in terms of, of DevOps salaries and software engineer salaries. Uh, yeah, I think that it, the, the salaries are going to change even though, or I'm sorry. I think the DevOps engineer salaries will grow uh, faster than software engineer salaries. But uh, it may be the same people that holds either of those positions. Anything else? Or do we go for beer? Who votes beer? Oh, wait, question in the back. Yeah, and you know, um, there, there are more people becoming uh, DevOps engineers. There are more, more groups doing it. The one thing that, that I do want to say about this is um, it, it hits upon a sore subject for me because DevOps is not about, um, it's not about a, a person or a group. It's not about a, a thing you do or a specific tool. DevOps is really a methodology. It's, it's a philosophy on how you want to uh, reduce, reduce contention across an organization to reduce waste and make things faster. And um, that, that's what it's really about. In my opinion, if you've titled yourself as a DevOps engineer, if, you've, if you're working in a DevOps group, you've automatically lost the DevOps battle. Or at least you've taken, uh, you've, you've lost a battle, maybe not the war. Um, This is not something that we're going to be able to, uh, to get past if we continue to do things the way that, that the DevOps community has practiced it. Again, we get a lot of, of participation in the DevOps arena from, from our practitioners in the field, people coming to, to DevOps days conferences, people coming to, to these learning experiences, and uh, citing that they've got problems, asking for, for help, um, coming up with, with ideas and wanting to get feedback from, from peers. Uh, all the while that we've got the community coming in, there's not going to be a solid definition of DevOps. Nobody will be able to say, this is what DevOps is, the same way that an Agile practitioner is able to explain what Scrum is or to explain what Kanban is. We've got a lot of different things. Uh, all of our organizations, all of our practitioners are coming from a different set of circumstances and a different set of needs. 
we're bringing it all together, and the only way that, that we can wrap our minds around it, uh, just through, through our own cognitive limitations, is to have different viewpoints or perspectives about it. Now, one thing that the DevOps community does really, really well is to be respectful of that. So um, there are a lot of processes that people are thinking about for, for DevOps, um, trunk-based development, for instance. And uh, that's getting a lot of uh, a lot of talk, a lot of um, revisiting to uh, to have people examine their their branching strategies. But um, it's not at the sake of of tooling. There are a lot of other people who feel that we need better tooling, CI/CD pipelines. We need we need some some orchestration tools, and all of that together is bringing up the whole body of DevOps. And it's giving more flexibility to different organizations to practice it how they think it's best going to, to service their, um, their particular uh, problem set and their particular culture. Anything else? Or do we vote for beer? Beer! Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, <laughs> I was a little bit surprised about the slide deck, too, so uh, that was a promise I lived up to. Thank you very much for, for your time.